So we are in Luke chapter three. We're continuing our study through this gospel. We are starting a new section today in Luke's gospel. And uh, just to get us caught up to, to introduce that, a lot has changed. So if you go down to uh, chapter three, go all the way down to verse 20, 23, it says, when he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age. So as chapter three begins, uh, there's, there's been quite some time uh, after chapter two. Now chapter two ended with Jesus being 12 years old. Now in chapter three begins and Jesus is going to be 30 years old. So uh, 18 years have gone by and a lot has changed in the world. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna read the verses one and two. We'll put the map up as we go. And it says in verse one, it says now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Now, Tiberius is a new Caesar. This is not Caesar Augustus that we knew back in chapter uh, two and uh, chapter one. But um, this Caesar, Tiberius, has been the Caesar in Rome now for 15 years. And uh, he's, he's somewhat of a brutal person. He's known for his cruelty. And then it goes on to say, and then there was Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea. Pontius Pilate is going to be the one who orders the execution of Jesus, the crucifixion. He is going to be over the area of Judea. Judea is the southern part of Israel. And of course, he's gonna be headquartered there in the town of Jerusalem. Well, then it goes on, it says, and Herod was the Tetrarch of Galilee. Now, this is not going to be Herod the Great that we knew back in the earlier chapter. Uh, this is going to be one of the sons of Herod. And there's gonna be three sons. They're all corrupt. The first one is mentioned as Herod. It says Herod the Tetrarch. Now, Tetrarch just means ruler over a fourth, ruler over a fourth. So uh, it's gonna be Herod was the Tetrarch of Galilee. So Galilee is the northern part of Israel. You have the Sea of Galilee up in the top, and that's where Jesus grew up, there in, in Nazareth. Then it goes on, his brother, another one of Herod's uh, sons, Philip, was the Tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis. Now, that's gonna be to the northeast of the map, not really part of our story today, another brutal guy, um, so I didn't put that on the map today. And then it says, Licinius was the Tetrarch of Abilene. Now, Abilene is a town in Texas, and, and uh, so... Abilene is to the north of Israel. Again, not really part of our story today, but it was up there. So these three brothers are sons of Herod. They're from the Herod family, and uh, they are known for their brutality and their corruption. So then you have the religious side of things going on at this time. And it says, and the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. And you go, well, why are there two high priests? Well, Annas was the high priest, but he offended Rome. So Rome steps in and takes him out of the position, and they install his son-in-law, Caiaphas. Now, the people look to Annas, but uh, the Rome looks to Caiaphas, and they're, they're both very, very corrupt. You remember the story where Jesus has to go in and clear the temple? Well, these are the guys that are in charge of what's going on there. So they're, they're very, very corrupt. So it's in this time of brutality and corruption. The next line there says, the word of God came to John. This is gonna be John the Baptist in uh, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness, in the wilderness. So the word of God comes to John, John the Baptist in the wilderness. The idea here is that the word of God is no longer coming from the temple, which should be the center of worship. So God's doing something very different. We'll talk about that today. So the question is, what was the word that came to John, John the Baptist? This is not John the Apostle, but John the Baptist. Well, um, in this very difficult time, corruption and violence and all that, verse 18 I've put on your outline. So we'll read it in, in, on the outline. Then when we come to it, we'll read it there also. So in verse 18, it's going to say, with many other exhortations. So you want to underline many other exhortations. He, that's John, John the Baptist, preached the gospel, gospel. And you want to underline the word gospel to the people. So as our story begins today, John the Baptist is preaching the gospel. So you want to write that down, the gospel. And uh, it's important to, to know that the word gospel just means good news. So, so write that down. Gospel just means good news. Uh, I grew up and um, 
in a certain church culture, church, certain church environment. And many of my friends do not walk with the Lord in part because what was told was good news was actually conveyed as bad news. And, and uh, they, they, they just said, I can't do it. Uh, but it's, it's good news. It's good news. And so hopefully we'll be able to see that as we go. Now, when we say good news, if you were to just take that from a literal translation, gospel and good news are the same word. So from a literal translation, there on your outline, Young's literal translation says he was proclaiming good news to the people. So John is going to be preaching the gospel good news, but he's also going to say some difficult things. And uh, what we're going to find is he does not believe in keeping it positive, you know, and warm and encouraging. So we'll just see that, know that as we go. So verse three, it says, he came into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance. And then I'm gonna talk about four the forgiveness of sins. So the first thing that we notice about John's gospel is he's going, the gospel, the good news, is going to involve repentance. You wanna write that down, repentance. Now, in the Greek and the English, the word repentance, I've, I've taken this from Webster, uh, repent just means to turn from sin, to dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life, to change one's mind, to change one's mind. And I thought one way, but now I think very, very differently. As we get into this, this is gonna be very different than traditional Jewish thought. Um, John's gospel that he's going to be preaching as he's pointing to Jesus, uh, he's not going to talk about bringing a sacrifice to the temple when he talks about repentance. It's gonna be very, very different. John is gonna talk about repentance and repentance is just recognizing that I'm, I'm not the person that I should be and, and I need to make a change. And so that's the, the sort of the foundation. Now, Matthew's gospel chimes in and gives just a little bit more detail on this. So I put that there on your outline. And it says, John's clothes were made of camel's hair. He had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. And the people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan confessing. You wanna underline the word confessing, confessing their sins. And they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, baptized by him in the Jordan River. They're coming to John not because he's flashy. Uh, they're coming to John because he's speaking truth. And the people uh, are, are not getting that where they are from and they're starving for truth. And so here's John and John's speaking the truth and it's resonating with them. So it says they're going out to him from all Judea. Judea is the southern part of the country, and then you have the, in the area of the Jordan. So you have the Jordan River goes from the northern part of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, all the way down to the Dead Sea. So what that means is people are traveling 20, 30 miles walking in order to hear what John has to say. Now keep in mind, this is the Middle East 2,000 years ago. There's no rest rooms, there's no um, restaurants, there's no hotels, and so there's something compelling. They want to be there and they wanna hear what he has to say. So again, whatever was happening at the temple at this point was not connecting the people, was not connecting with the people and they weren't being connected with God. So they're looking for something. And John's message is very different than what they've heard in the past. So we also see in that little paragraph that in John's gospel, repentance involves confession. You wanna write that down, confession. It says they were confessing their sins. Now, I and pretty much everybody holds, they're, they're not listing every sin that they've ever committed. You know, last Tuesday, I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this. That's not the idea. But what they're doing is they're confessing that they're not the people that they should be. And they're, they're, they're just not right with, with God. If, if we were to look at that, say, in, in our culture, you know, the first commandment is, is you, you know, you love the Lord your God and with all your heart, soul, strength, and might. You, know, you don't put anything before God. No idols, no anything. And, and so that's, that's sort of the, the first thing. And, um, but in our culture right now, a regular church attender is, is defined by somebody who will attend church at least once every six weeks. And so as a church culture, I would say that we live by and large with God not being the highest priority of our life. Would, would that make sense to you? 
and, and so that's not you people, because you know you're here. So it's it's those other people. So we're. <laughs> but but the point the point is that we we've all we've all been there. Now I get that sometimes we can't be here, and that and that's that's fine. But much of Christianity lives as though God is maybe a priority, but not the priority. And so just like they were recognizing, hey, there's some areas of our life we are recognizing there's some areas in our life that, you know, maybe we're not completely right with God. We also notice, and and I put this on your outline, John did not baptize until someone repented, or we would say confessed, repented and confessed. What this means, and you find this throughout the New Testament, um, it was only adults that were baptized. The babies were not baptized. And it was always those who had repented and, and confessed. And then we also notice the very last line of that paragraph, it says they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, in the Jordan River. Now, what that means as they would go into the water is that it, it, and they, they, it means that they weren't sprinkling is, is the idea. It was actually immersion. The word baptism there on your outline, uh, baptisma, means to immerse, to go completely under the water. Let me just say, I'm not hostile to sprinkling. That's not my point. I'm just saying that in the Bible, every time somebody is baptized, it's always after they have repented, and it's always by immersion, okay? So I'm not taking a shot at anybody. I'm just noticing, here's what you see in, in the Bible, Another thing that we need to recognize here is that they were baptized because of forgiveness, not to get forgiveness. Very important. So if you take the Bible in basic English, it'll take Luke chapter 3, verse 3, and it'll translate it like this, I think, more accurately for us. He came into all the country round about Jordan, preaching baptism as a sign of forgiveness. Underline that, as a sign of forgiveness for those whose hearts were changed. So they repented and then they were baptized. And so um, baptism was the sign of what had taken place. Now in verse three in your Bible, let me just say one thing very quickly. It says he came into all the district around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now we, we read that and sometimes we make the mistake, say baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we think it's baptism to get the forgiveness of sins. It's a very common mistake. Let me, uh, the best illustration that I I know to explain this is let's say you're exceeding the speed, you get pulled over, and you get a ticket for speeding. A ticket for speeding. Did you get the ticket to get the speeding, or did you get the ticket because of the speeding. Well, in case you don't know, it's, it's, it's because you, you're speeding. Okay, so if you knew my younger days, I'm very familiar with this, by the way. But the ticket is not to get the speeding, even though you say ticket for speeding, it's because of the speeding. So here, it's not um, baptism to get the forgiveness, it's baptism because of the forgiveness. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so, so think that through. So the Jewish people now, when you look at the, the religion and the, and the culture and the customs, they didn't typically get baptized. So Gentiles who would want to convert to Judaism, they would become baptized. Their baptism was a sign of conversion into Judaism. But here you have the Jewish people, the Gentiles, and everybody's being baptized uh, because of the forgiveness of sins. So the idea is the gospel that John is preaching is putting everybody, the Jewish people and the Gentiles, all on the same level. We all have to come into it the same way. So, so far in this gospel that John is preaching, we have repentance, we have confession, followed by baptism because of the forgiveness of sins. Now, this is slightly different than we baptize today. They're they're very close, but slightly different. When we are baptized as Christians, our our immersion into the water identifies us with Jesus' death, his burial, and then his resurrection. So we come up to live in newness of life. This baptism of repentance 
similar but, but different, uh, that John presented identified a person with their need to get right with God and be cleansed. And so when you get into the book of Acts later on, you'll find that people were familiar with the baptism of John, but then they would then be baptized in the name of Jesus. So this is kind of preparing the way for what's coming. Well, verse four, it says, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and this is gonna be John's job description, which was mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, the, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, in my Bible, in the margin, I just put this as John's, uh, John's job or John's job description. Then it goes on to say, every ravine will be filled, every mountain and hill will be brought low, and the crooked will become straight, and the rough roads smooth, and all flesh will see the salvation of God. And I've underlined all of verse six, all, all flesh will see the salvation of God. Now, when you, you read this here, when it says the ravines will come up and the high places will come down, it's not saying that everything's gonna become completely flat. That's not the idea. Everything that we're talking about here is regarding salvation. Verse six tells us all flesh will see the salvation of God. So when you read a commentary on this, they'll say that when it talks about the low places, those are the low places in our life that need to be raised up and healed, and that's what the gospel will do. Um, The high places would be the pride and the arrogance, and that needs to come down. And then the crooked, you know, the crooked places and all that. When we come to the Lord, and many of us, we came to the Lord, we came with our addictions, we came with our messed up relationships. And when we came to the Lord, that's when he began to smooth out and straighten our lives. And we could go around the room and all of us could tell the testimonies of how messed up certain things were in certain parts of our life. We come to Jesus and he begins to work in those areas. Would you agree with that? So, so that's what's happening here. So that, that's the idea. And so um, when it talks about the gospel, this gospel that he's preaching, write this down. The gospel means that Jesus is going to correct uh, all that is wrong with us. So we come to Jesus and he begins to work in our lives and put back the broken pieces and, and, and put us back together. And if that's true, and that's the true understanding of this passage, him stepping in and correcting all that's been a mess in our past, then this is really good news. This is good news that he wants to do that for us. But then also verse six, it says, in all flesh we'll see the salvation of God. And what he's saying is this gospel that he's preaching is going to be for everyone, it's for everyone. Well, verse seven. Um, verse seven, it says, so he began saying to the crowds, who were going out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. And you want to underline viper. He's warming up the crowd, building a bridge, (laughs) staying positive. So you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the, now please underline the wrath to come, the wrath to come. And we'll talk about that later. Therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father, for I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Well, again, John has a way with the crowd. So when it says here in Luke's gospel, it says he's saying to the crowds, uh, what we find is that in the other gospels, he's speaking to a specific crowd here. So it's gonna be a little bit more focused. Matthew will say it like this. Matthew will say, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, you want to underline that, tells us who he's speaking to, coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers. Now underline the word vipers there also. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? So what we find is when he says you brood of vipers, he's actually speaking specifically to the religious leadership, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So the crowds are coming, but in that crowd, there's a crowd of of this group. Your brood is your family. So when when our kids were small, uh, we talk about, you know, we got our brood, you know, all of our kids, and we're taking our brood here. So your, your brood, you know, is a reference to your family. And here, he's telling them that their family is snakes. They're from the family of snakes. So who's the big snake in the Bible? Satan, Satan. So he's telling me, your family, Satan. You're from Satan's family. Um, But what's so interesting is that the words snake and viper 
are two different words in the, in the original language. So a snake can be anything, but a viper is always a poisonous snake. And so he says, you brood of poisonous snakes. The idea is your family is snakes, not just snakes, they're poisonous snakes. And everywhere you go, because that's your family, all you're doing is bringing death and pain and, and all, all types of negative stuff. So he calls them brood of vipers. Literally, he's calling them sons of the devil, um, which is going to be a major insult to them. So it's, it's kind of gutsy, but John doesn't really care. Which we'll see. Verse eight, therefore... Bear fruit in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. So to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, he says, don't say uh, you have Abraham as your father. You know, they would say, well, I'm Jewish. We're chosen. We're the chosen people. They believed that everybody that was Jewish, because of that was their heritage, they were saved. They were saved. They were right with God because they were Jewish. And the point that he says, he says, you know, God can raise up stones to make them children of Abraham. The point that I, I want to make, I didn't put this on your outline, but I probably should, but just make a note of this. My heritage doesn't make me right with God. So they were pointing to the fact that they were Jewish, descendants of Abraham, and so they thought they were right with God. That same concept is true today. Our heritage does not make us right with God. If you ever ask somebody and you'll hear different, different responses and you say, well, tell me about your relationship with Jesus. And they don't tell you about their relationship with Jesus. They start talking about their heritage. How's your relationship with Jesus? And they go, well, I'm, I'm Catholic and I, I was an altar boy, okay? And what they do is they point to their heritage, not their relationship. Well, it's not just that, uh, maybe something a little bit closer to our context. You say, what's your relationship with the Lord? And they say, well, well, I'm Baptist. Not only that, my grandmother played the organ in church for 40 years. How many of you ever heard something like that? Yeah. So they point to their heritage, but our heritage does not make us right with God. So it doesn't matter what denomination, what brand, whatever, uh, your heritage does not make you right with God. I would hate to know that somebody in this church would say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm Calvary. You know, being Calvary doesn't make you right with God. Your relationship makes you right with God. So that's the point that he's saying. So if John were here today, he'd say, you know, I, God could turn these stones into churchgoers. That's not what makes you right with, with God. So heritage doesn't make you right with God. Now, John believes, let me just read verse eight again. He says, therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So here, I want you to write down, John believes that repentance is a change in, a, a, a change in mind leads to a change in behavior. You want to have fruit in keeping with repentance. So, uh, so he says there should be a change. So verse nine, he says, indeed the ax is already laid at the root of the trees so that every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and you need to underline thrown into the fire, thrown into the fire. We'll come back to verse nine, verse 10. And the crowds were questioning him, saying, then, then what shall we do? Well, remember that John here is, is, is preaching the gospel. And so he's going to define what repentance looks like, what it, what it means. And so there on your outline, let me just remind us one more time of verse 18. Verse 18. And in verse 18, once again, he says, so with and you want to underline again, many other exhortations, many other exhortations. He preached the gospel to the people. John is going to preach many other exhortations. Luke isn't going to list all of the other exhortations. He's only, only going to list a few of the exhortations. Now keep in mind, Luke is, is the only writer of the New Testament who's Gentile. He's writing to a Gentile uh, crowd who are becoming believers. Matthew writes to a Jewish crowd. So Luke is writing to a Gentile crowd. And so Luke is going to focus in on the exhortations that would be primarily focused that he would say that the, the Gentiles need to hear. As we get into these exhortations, you and I are going to look at these things and we're going to say, 
You know, these are just basic Christianity. It's the basic stuff. However, if you studied what the Gentile world was like 2,000 years ago outside of Israel, uh, you'd come to the conclusion very quickly that this would be very radical uh, living for the Gentile world, the population of the day. So keep that in mind as we go. Let me also say, we are not saved because we do these things. We're, we're saved because of what Jesus did for us. But if we have repented, we, we were saved, uh, then these things should just be the way this is lived out in our lives. This should be um, automatic, natural, however you'd want to say that, the bare minimum. So verse 11 he talks about, here's, here's some of the, the ways. And it says, uh, let me just read verse 10 again. The crowds were questioning him saying, then what shall we do? And he would answer and say to them, the man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And he who has food is to do likewise. So here, when he defines repentance, what does it look like? Write this down. Repentance would mean a change in how I view possessions which would be very radical to the Gentile world who wanted to grab all that they could and hang on to it. So the idea is don't, don't talk about how blessed you are. Do something, do something, be, be a blessing to somebody else. Write this down. Repentance says I'm blessed so that I can be a blessing. I'm blessed so I can be a blessing. I want to be a blessing to the Lord. I want to be a blessing to people. God has blessed me, so I want to bless back. So that's the first one. Uh, to you and I, that's very basic. To the Gentile world, that would be somewhat radical where you grabbed all you could and you held on. Well, then verses 12 and 13, it says, and some tax collectors, tax collectors also came to be baptized. And they said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, well, collect no more than what you've been ordered to. Now, again, he's writing to the Gentile world. So here, a repentance is going to mean a change in how I conduct my business. And there's going to be some ethics. So if you were a tax collector there in Israel, um, tax collectors who were Jewish, who worked for the Roman government, they were viewed as, as traitors. The way that you would become a tax collector is Rome would say, we have this area here, and we want to raise this much money. And uh, so if you think you can raise that much money, you know, you bid on it and you say, okay, I'll raise this much and, and then you, you get to do that. So what you would do then if you were a tax collector, imagine, and, and let's, uh, you, you would add on a little surcharge to the taxes that you're to raise. Let's just say 5%, 5%. So let's just say, I'm gonna use very, very conservative numbers here. Let's say you're the tax collector placed here by the Romans in the area of Jupiter. And uh, you just have to raise $50 million of taxes. Now, it's, it's a lot more than that, I know. But, uh, but all you do is you raise that and you just add on 5% to keep for yourself. Well, 5% of 50, on top of $50 million, most of us could probably make it on that, couldn't you? <laughs> it's a few million dollars. So the tax collectors were becoming very wealthy and, and there was, you know, just taking advantage of the people. So the idea here would be that repentance means no questionable business practices. So in the Gentile world where they were known for their dishonesty, this is a, a level of ethics that would be very foreign to them. By the way, it doesn't say that it's wrong to be a, a tax collector. I don't know what you do with that, but it said, doesn't say that it's wrong to be a tax collector. Um, verse 14, then it goes on and it says, now some soldiers, and most hold that these would be Roman soldiers, were questioning him saying, and, and what about us? What shall we do? And he said to them, do not take money from anyone by force. My Bible says force. How many of your Bibles use the word extort? Extort, okay. Either way, both are good. Uh, or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. So what's going on there? So let's say you're a Roman soldier. You come into the area of Israel and you're not paid a lot as a Roman soldier. But, um, and the, the Jewish people that you're there as a soldier in that area, they're not Roman citizens. So they don't have any rights. They don't have any rights. So the Roman soldiers would go in and extort from the people. Now it's very interesting, I find, at least I, I find the word here, do not extort. The Greek word there on your outline, I took this from the NIV translation, diaseio, and I might be mispronouncing that slightly, uh, money from anyone. But that word diaseio, uh, mean or extort means to shake violently. Does everybody see that? 
The word just means to shake violently, and we translate it into English uh, to extort. So what they would do is they would go in, and they'd, they're not making a lot of money, so they'd go in and rough up the people, and they'd say, you're going to pay us money for protection. And you'd say, well, aren't, aren't you supposed to be protecting us? No, you're paying us money to protect you from us. And if you don't, we're going to shake you violently is the idea. So you'd be paying that. So here, uh, repentance would mean a change in how I use my power and or influence. How I use my power and or influence. So when you repent, your, your power and your influence is no longer to be used to take advantage of people. It's to be a blessing to people. You use your influence to be a blessing to people. Well, so those are three, and we'll go a little bit further. Verse 15, it says, Now, while the people were in a state of expectation, all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he was the Christ. And he hears this, verse 16. And John answered and said to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. And that would be sort of the, the job of the lowest servant in, in the house uh, to, to do that. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, verse 17. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, and he will burn up the chaff with, and you need to underline, unquenchable fire, unquenchable fire. That means it never goes out, doesn't go out. Verse 18. So with many other exhortations, it says, he preached the gospel to the people. We just get a, a, a couple of those, of those uh, exhortations. Then it goes on, verse 19. But when Herod the Tetrarch was reprimanded by him because of Herodias. Herod is the male, Herod Dias is the female way. So this is a, a female who's part of Herod's household. So it says, when he was reprimanded by him by, uh, because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the wicked things which Herod had done, Herod also added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. So here, John is reprimanding Herod. And uh, early on, Herod, this Herod, one of the sons of Herod the Great, liked to hear John speak. As a matter of fact, there on your outline, it says, because Herod was afraid of John and protected him, he knew John was a good and holy man. Also, though John's preaching always bothered him, he enjoyed listening to him. Okay, so early on, he liked to listen to John. But John is becoming more and more outspoken about something in Herod's life. So hopefully I can explain this. Um, Herod, the king, had married another king's daughter uh, as a favor to Caesar. So that's his wife. And, um, but around the time of John's ministry, Herod goes to visit his brother Philip on his way to Rome. While he's there, uh, his brother Philip has the wife whose name is Herodias. She is Philip and Herod's niece, Herodias, because she's of the family of Herod. So he has an affair with his brother's wife, who's also his niece. And then he comes back to Jerusalem with his brother's wife, exiles his wife, and then marries his niece, who is also his brother's wife. And you thought your family was messed up. <laughs> <laughs> so here you know, <laughs> write this down by the way that was according to uh, Leviticus 18 16 you can't take your brother's wife um, but here repentance would mean a change in morality a change in morality you can't take your brother's wife now remember Luke is a Gentile he's writing to the Gentile world promiscuity was rampant in the Gentile world so for us, it's probably not take, I hope, our brother's wife who happens to be our niece. Hopefully that's not the, the, the case. But um, it could be taking 
what belongs to someone's future spouse for our own gratification, and that is stealing. That is stealing. In the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, sex is for marriage. It's an incredible gift for marriage. And anything outside of that is against the way that God has designed it. So you can't walk with God and at the same time walk in opposition to God. The two will not go together. So Herod was confronted about his sexual sin. He does not repent. He does not repent. And because he doesn't repent, he just becomes more hardened and not wanting to repent and ultimately hardened to the place where he will be the one who has John the Baptist executed. As it relates to, to sexuality, um, let, let me just say, um, if you're single here today, your future spouse, ladies, your future husband, guys, your future wife, they will never turn to you and say, you know, I really wish you would have had more sexual partners before we got married. They will never say that because everybody wants to feel like they're special, not they're just the last one on a long string of partners. And, and, and so you, you want to come to the place where if you are involved in a sexual relationship that is outside of marriage, you want to repent. And that's going to mean a change in behavior. Does that make sense? So you want to keep that in mind. Well, as we talk about the gospel, we've talked about repentance, confession, baptism, but there is another aspect of the gospel, which is equally part of the gospel. But sadly, in much of our church world, we tend to skip over this part of, of the gospel. And so the, the part of the gospel that's equally part, there in your outline, write this down. Part of the gospel is understanding what I'm saved from what I'm saved from. So there on your outline front says from the wrath to come. Now, for those who repent, uh, we're saved from the wrath to come. So everybody go back to verse seven real quick. We'll do this very fast. Verse seven, it says at the very last line, uh, the wrath to come. If we are saved, you're, you're saved from the wrath to come. If you go to verse nine, it talks about thrown into the fire. You're saved from that. When you repent, you're saved from that. Now, everybody go to verse 17, verse 17. And then it talks about the very last line. It talks about the unquenchable fire, the unquenchable fire. Unquenchable fire means that it never ends. It never ends. If you are saved, you are saved from that unquenchable fire. Three times in this chapter, so we don't miss it, it's going to reference hell. As a, as, a, as a reality. So if we're saved from that, that wrath to come, then you want to write this down. That is very good news. Very good news. So in this chapter, he's highlighting that he's preaching the gospel, but he, he highlights hell three times. Um, when you're saved, it's important to know that, that when you're saved, it's because something bad was about to happen, and before that bad thing happened, you were saved. So the gospel is not enhancing, it's saving us from something very bad. God does not send anybody to hell because of sin entering in. Man's condition was we were all on our way to hell. God looked at us and he said, I can't bear to see you pay the price for your sins. So God said, here's what I'm going to do because of his great love for us. He said he would come to the earth as a man and then he would live a perfect life and he would step into our place on the cross and he would pay that price for us so that we didn't have to. So because he paid the price when we stand before him, he's able to say, it's all paid, it's all paid. But he references three times that there is an unquenchable fire. The reason that we aren't telling more people about Jesus is because, by and large, we do not believe in the unquenchable fire. Because if you believed in the unquenchable fire, you'd let some people know. Do you agree with that? 
So we've lost that, and we need to get that back because it's part of the gospel. So, um, so anyways, well, verse 21, we're gonna go fast here. Verse 21, it says, now when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized while he was praying. Luke is the only gospel that highlights while Jesus was praying. Heaven was opened up, the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form, like, like, everybody underlined the word like, 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 like a dove, and a voice came out of heaven, you are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. A lot here, but um, when it says that the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form, it says like a dove. Now what that means is it was not a dove. If the Holy Spirit descended as a dove or a dove descended, it would just say that, but it says like a dove, which tells us it was not a dove. You guys gonna be okay with that, by the way? So, so what it's saying, when it says like, it says, it's saying we saw this happen and it, it, was, it was like, the best way I can describe it, it was like a dove descending. But guys, a bird did not land on Jesus. That's not the point, but that's the best way to, to describe it. So Jesus decides to get baptized, not because he needs to, but he identifies with us in our sinful condition, and so he, he's baptized. A lot more to that. But here's the point. Write this down. If I have repented, uh, changed my mind, then it's time to be baptized. It's time to be baptized. So for us, many of us were baptized as babies, and, and that's fine. But I, I would say that in the Bible, what we see is no one is baptized until they repent and, and they confess. They're, they're saved at that point. And then they follow with baptism. They follow with baptism. So I'm not saying if you were baptized as a baby, you're not saved. I'm not saying that at, at, at all. But what I am saying is I would encourage you as somebody who has now come to the place where you said, yes, I was baptized as a baby, but now I've repented. There's been a change in my life. I've received the free gift that God has given me. And so now I want to follow him in baptism. And that becomes your decision to identify with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. It's also the time that you can point to and say, on that day, I was baptized. I knew that God was doing something in my life. If that's you and you haven't been baptized, then would you write baptism on your connection card, put it in one of the offering boxes on the way out, and uh, we'll let you know as we plan the next baptism so that you can participate in that. We are so out of time. I'm gonna close in prayer. Did you find that interesting today? Yes. Good, 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 good. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, speaking to us and recognizing that like them, we need to repent, confess. I haven't been who I need to be. There's gonna be some changes that would just automatically take place because I have repented and, and I, I have received you. So we, we just purpose to make that change. If you're here today and you've never invited Jesus into your life, simply say, Jesus, come into my life. Thank you for forgiving me. I want you to step into my life. I want to follow you. And so I'm, I'm inviting you in and I'm giving myself to you. If that's you today, he promises to never leave. Let someone know that you've made that decision. There'll be prayer partners in the front. Let us know in your connection card, but let somebody know. Again, there'll be a communion served on both sides of the platform today. And uh, so... I pray, God, that you keep each and every one of us until we meet again. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you guys. We love you. We'll see you next time.